Hello, and thanks for watching. Uh, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this presentation is on Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part One, and I've called it very simply History. So let me just begin with an overview of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. I'm going to start by talking about what a history play is and what history is as a literary genre and a subject uh, of literature and, of course, a subject of academic study. I'll talk about Shakespeare's histories, those plays that we call the history plays and why we call them that and what that means. Uh, talk about Henry IV, the play Henry IV, Part I, and the different titles that it was published under in Shakespeare's time, and how those titles shift the focus for what the play is about. Uh, I'll talk about representing history, history in Shakespeare's time, how history was, was presented and understood, um, and how Shakespeare challenges that in his own representations of history. And I'll end by talking about Henry's Road to the Crown, giving you uh, an overview of the play Richard II, which is the play that precedes Henry IV, uh, temporally speaking, and uh, talk about how Henry became king and what that sets us up for at the beginning of this play. So here on the left is a portrait of our man, King Henry IV himself. And uh, the question here is, uh, this is called a history play. That's the term that we use to group the Henry IV plays, as well as a number of others. And what really does that genre designation mean? What is a history play, both to us, and what was a history play to Shakespeare and his audience? So let's start with what the word history means to us as a modern audience. History as history. Um, when we say the word history, there's a few different things that we can mean, but they're all very closely related. And I've taken some excerpts from the Oxford English Dictionary uh, to give us a formal definition of, of what history means to the modern to the modern ear when we hear that word. Um, it can mean specifically a written narrative constituting a continuous chronological record of important or public events uh, in a particular place, particular trend, institution, or person's life. So the history of Texas A&M, the history of Texas, the history of uh, Donald Trump, whatever it might be. Right. So uh, a narrative that lists events or talks about events um, in a chronological order that is going from past to present. So that's one definition. Very similar definition, broadening a little bit. History as just the entire branch, branch of knowledge that deals with past events, the formal record or study of past events, especially human affairs. So all these different books, the history of Texas, the history of England, the history of Nike shoes, the history of painting, these are all part of the larger subject of history as such. And that brings us to these two final excerpts um, from the dictionary definition of history. The whole series of past events connected with a particular person, country, institution, or thing. The aggregate of past events, the course of human affairs. So everything that has happened in the past is history. And the way we record it, the way we write about it is history. The way we study it, that these are all things that we mean by history. So to give a little brief overview or summary, when we think about history, uh, we are often thinking in about something that's chronological, think something that is organized from past to present, but it's not just a list of things, it's a narrative, there's cause and effect, right? So some event happens and that leads to another event and that leads to another event. History means things that are important and of course what we consider important now and what was considered important 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago are different. Um, so today, what might we might we consider things important that that weren't considered important in past to past historians. Um, so thinking about what is important enough to be recorded, what is considered by a, a culture, by a society significant in their development. And of course, finally, when we think of history, we think of things that are factual, things that are truthful. We don't count, for example, Homer's The Iliad as history because it's a story of legendary mythical events, things that didn't happen. So it's fiction. It's not history. So these are, again, this is a summary of some of the important ideas that we have in our minds when we think of what history is.
And here's a copy of the title page of the first printing of Henry IV, of Shakespeare's Henry IV, printed in 1598. You'll notice Shakespeare's name does not appear anywhere on the title page, uh, signaling that at the time his name was not was not considered as a selling point. But the play itself was popular enough to be printed and sold, but they just didn't put Shakespeare's name on it. Uh, now, if we look at this, it says the history of Henry IV. He's a king with the battle at Shrewsbury between the king and Lord Henry Percy. This sounds like what we think of as history. This is an important event. It's about an important person. Um, it's it's something that had a significant uh, impact on English hist on on English history on the uh, the country and the way it developed. So this seems to be using the term history very similar to the way that we use the term history. But in Shakespeare's time, the word history could also more simply just be another word for story, any tale, any narrative. And oftentimes we see in many works of the period, um, we see the word history being used for subjects to describe stories, subjects that are manifestly non-historical by our standards. So two examples from Shakespeare's career, uh, the play that we more commonly called the Merchant of Venice. Um, the full name, or at least the first part of the full name is The Comical History of the Merchant of Venice. And this, again, it's a comedy. There's no intent here to make us think that these are events that really happened. Um, it's clearly a fictional tale, but it's called a history. So it's meaning just story. Uh, another example would be the play, um, the first time it was printed, Shakespeare's play, King Lear. It was first printed as The History of King Lear. Later, it was printed with a different title, The Tragedy of King Lear. Lear was considered by Shakespeare and uh, uh, people of his time as a real uh, uh, historical king, but now we think of him, we, we think Lear did not actually exist. This is just a, a legendary king. But Shakespeare uses, or, or people, whoever published the, the plays, use the term history and tragedy, both those terms to refer to this play. So again, what history means here, does this mean history as in historical or just story. Similarly, other plays that Shakespeare writes that are definitely on historical subjects are often titled tragedies. So Richard III, the full title is The Tragedy of Richard III, The Tragedy of King Richard II, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar, and there are other examples. But these three plays are all about historical subjects, people that actually existed, events that actually happened, although of course Shakespeare makes, um, uh, takes liberties with these, with the facts, but they're all on historical subjects, yet they're not called histories. So what do we get from this? Well, just quite simply, the idea that history as a genre was not yet a fully defined distinct genre in Shakespeare's time. Um, what history meant when applied to a literary text, calling a literary text a history or historical, that could just mean it's a story. It could mean it is about historical events, events that happened in the past, but it could just be a fictional story meant to entertain. And also um, the idea of tragedy, that history itself, the events of the past, could be tragic. That that uh, So these genre barriers were very porous. They're not necessarily distinct things. History could be tragic. Tragedy could be historical. Comedy can be a history, even if it's fiction. So when, when Shakespeare calls something a history or when his publishers call something a history, what that means, it's in flux. And that's going to be important as we start to consider what Shakespeare's doing in this play with his multiple characters and plot lines. So let's think about, more specifically, history as a genre. What are Shakespeare's histories? What do we call Shakespeare's histories and why do we call them that? So why do we call this a history play? Um, and why do we group it with a number of other plays as histories and some not as histories? Well, um, it really goes back to 1623 and the publication of Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies.
This is a very large volume. Uh, it collected 36 of Shakespeare's plays, almost all of his plays, 18 of which had never before been printed by that time. Um, it was a it's a large, carefully prepared and expensive volume, um, signaling that Shakespeare's name and his works were popular enough that a printer would go into uh, would make the the financial outlay to uh, produce something like this. And it's prepared by two actors who were in Shakespeare's troupe, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, and they prepared it um, a few years after Shakespeare's death. We call this the first folio. Uh, folio is a term for, for the, the size of paper that, that is printed on. But as you can tell from the title, Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies, the, uh, uh, the editors, Hemmings and Condell, or perhaps the publisher, um, decided to organize the plays in a certain way and group them into these three categories. Uh, so here's a copy of the uh, table of context, contents or catalog. Again, we see them listed in three groups and arranged in that order. So first it prevent, prints the 14 comedies, 14 plays known as, uh, that, it, that it considered comedies, uh, then the 10 history plays, and then the 12 tragedies. Uh, and if you count, you'll notice actually that the table of contents only lists 11 tragedies. Uh, for some reason, uh, the Troilus and Cressida, a play called Troilus and Cressida, was mistakenly left out of the list. Um, it appears in the folio between the life of King Henry VIII and the tragedy of Coriolanus. So what's the common thread that unites those plays that are known as histories and separates out those other plays that might be on historical subjects but are not counted in that group? The histories are all plays that are centered on English monarchs, English history after the Norman conquest of 1066. So that's the common thread. They're about the English people, the modern English people, at least in, in Shakespeare's time, what would be considered the modern, modern English people. So the centuries, the few centuries leading up to Shakespeare's time. Um, and that's what unites them as a history of the English people. There are plays, two plays, Cymbeline and King Lear, which do take place um, on, the, on the island, but they are from a pre-Christian time. Cymbeline goes as far back as, as the Roman uh, uh, Empire, um, but these are before the Norman Conquest, so they're before what Shakespeare and his, and his audience would have considered their England to some extent. Um, Cymbeline, incidentally, was based on a real monarch. King Lear, as I mentioned before, based on a mythical legendary monarch, um, although in Shakespeare's time they would not have uh, made that distinction between them. But since they're from this earlier, um, again, ancient time, they are not counted as histories. Macbeth is another play that's also on a historical subject and is set on the island of Great Britain, but it's up in Scotland, not in England. Uh, and it is historical despite the, the witches and the supernatural elements, but um, because it's set in a different country and thus deals with a different people, it's not counted in the histories. And then finally, we have the Roman plays, Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Coriolanus. These plays are based on historical subjects, real historical figures, but since they're set in ancient Rome, a different land, a different time, a different people, they're not counted as part of the history plays. So history about the English monarchs in the decades and centuries leading up to Shakespeare's time. So what Shakespeare would have considered the birth, and Shakespeare's audience would have considered the birth of modern England. So if you were to go back to the uh, table of contents image of the folio, you'd say that the plays are listed in a certain order, and that order follows the chronological timeline of the kings themselves. So they're, they're listed in the folio and printed in the folio in order of when, they, when the events described actually occurred. So we begin with King John, who is the earliest uh, monarch, um, post-conquest monarch that Shakespeare talks about. Uh, 1199 to 1216 was his reign. Richard II has a play about him, the two Henry IV plays, the Henry V play, three plays on Henry VI, um, Edward IV is the monarch at the beginning of Richard III. There isn't a play about him, but he's the monarch in between Henry VI and Richard III. And then we have a play, of course, the play Richard III. And finally, Henry VIII, um, one of Shakespeare's last written plays, covers the, the most recent time in uh, English history, all the way up to the birth of Queen Elizabeth. 
So this is the order in which the, the historical events occurred. This is the order in which the kings reigned. And this is the order in which the plays were printed in the folio. However, that was not the order in which the plays were written. Uh, based on what we know of their performance history and their publication history, this is actually the order in which the plays were probably composed. You see that the plays that we now call Henry VI Part Two and Part Three were actually the first of the plays, the first of Shakespeare's history plays. Henry VIII uh, was composed much later in his career, near the end of his career. So now this may seem odd that Henry VI Part Two and Part Three were published before Henry VI Part One. But that's because they were not called that. That's, those weren't the names they were given at the time. And in fact, the plays that we call Henry VI Parts 2 and 3 um, are the only ones that have titles that explicitly, that when they were originally printed, that only had titles, uh, that had titles that explicitly referred to each other. Henry VI Part 2 was called the first part of the contention of the Houses of York and Lancaster. Henry VI Part 3 was called the second part of the contention. Um, but by 1623 and the publication of the folio, we see that the titles have been changed to create a, a link between them. So we have the first part of Henry VI, the second part, the third part. Um, they're changed in order to make them uh, link together as part of a whole. One final way that the plays are grouped is into two tetralogies, and a tetralogy just means four works. A trilogy is three, tetralogy is four. Uh, so one group of works is called by scholars today the first tetralogy, the first set of four works. And that comprises Henry VI, Part I, II, and III, and Richard III. And those compose a single tetralogy because they are more or less one continuous storyline. Um, again, they weren't necessarily written to be that way, but they cover uh, one historical narrative from the beginning of the War of the Roses um, to uh, ultimately to the uh, death of Richard III and the uh, ascension of Henry VII to the kingship. The second tetralogy, so-called because it was written second, even though the plays temporarily take place earlier, consists of Rich Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V. Uh, and so scholars today call this the second tetralogy. It's also sometimes called the Henriad, as in the journey of Henry, because um, the four plays are, are essentially about characters named Henry. Uh, but that's the second tetralogy, again, because it was written second. And that's what scholars, the term scholars use to, again, convey the idea that they are connected, even if they weren't written as a continuous narrative, they are connected to each other in terms of the history that they describe. Richard II ends with Henry IV becoming king. Um, Henry IV, parts one and two, follow through his reign, and then Henry V is the reign of his son. So some continuing questions that scholars still ask, um, and I'm gonna center these primarily on the plays that we're focusing on, although we could modify them and, and ask them about um, uh, many of the other plays as well. When we look at Henry IV, parts one and two, which we'll be reading in our class this semester, are they separate plays? Is Henry IV, part one, a single play, and Henry IV, part two, a single play? Do they stand on their own? Or are they two parts of one longer story? And how do they change when we see them as separate versus see them as together? How are the four plays in the tetralogy related as a whole, from Richard II all the way to Henry V? How are they related? What exactly is their connection? I mean, certainly they are, but in what way? And then if we consider, and, and we're not going to be looking at, of course, at the uh, at both tetralogies um, or the, the other two plays in the first, in the second tetralogy even, but on a broader scale, how do all of Shakespeare's history plays, or at least these eight that cover more or less a, a continuous period of time, how are they connected? Is there some meaning that we can get or some idea, understanding of English history, Shakespeare's perspective on it, when we look at these two tetralogies together? And there have been attempts to say, well, they could do convey a whole, a single narrative that justifies, that leads to and justifies the ascension of the Tudor monarchs. But um, more recently, scholars have really begun to question that. 
And while we do see connections between all these plays, um, they also are all very distinct in their own way. So it's always a, a dialectic or a balancing act of seeing how do we see them together? How do we see them apart? And how do those two different perspectives combine or inform each other? So let's look at the play Henry IV uh, with a special focus on the titles uh, in which it's published, under which it was published, and how that shifts our focus in subtle ways. So here's a close-up uh, again of the 1598 title page, the first printing of Henry IV, and we see the title it's given, the full title is The History of Henry IV with the Battle at Shrewsbury between the King and Lord Henry Percy, surnamed Henry Hotspur of the North, with the humorous conceits of Sir John Falstaff. So a few things to note here, we have this triple focus. Uh, on the one hand, we have King Henry IV and Henry Percy, that is Hotspur, identified as opponents. And we're given the name of uh, the title of the, the central event, the climax of the play, which is the Battle at Shrewsbury. Yet there's also this third character named, that's John Falstaff, and his comic exploits. And that seems to be a big contrast from this battle between Hotspur and Henry IV. So the first question we might ask, especially once we've read the play, is where's Prince Hal in this title? Prince Hal is a major figure in this play. He's King Henry's son. He's going to be the future king. He's John Falstaff's close friend. Where is he in this play? And, and of course, he's the person who kills Henry Percy. So why is he not mentioned in the title? Uh, the other thing, of course, to notice about the title is no mention of first part, second part. It's just the history of Henry IV. So it gives us the sense that this is a play that can stand on its own. Now let's fast forward 25 years to the 1623 folio. And this is the printing of the first page in the folio of, the, uh, of Henry IV. The title here, the first part of Henry IV with the life and death of Henry surnamed Hotspur. A much shorter title uh, and very different in terms of the way it focuses our attention. So we have this shift of focus. It's mentioned that this is the first part so this has been explicitly connected to Henry IV, Part Two. Whether that is because the plays were being performed together or because people were thinking about them together, uh, perhaps, perhaps not. Perhaps it's probably more likely that it's because they're both printed in the same volume. So in order to make the volume as a whole seem more connected, tying the first part and the second part together, making them two, two plays on the same subject. And now notice the mention of Shrewsbury is dropped, and instead we have the life and death of Henry, surnamed Hotspur. Now by saying that this is the first part of the history of the Henry IV with the life and death of Hotspur, it makes it sound like Hotspur is really the central character, that the play is about his life and his death. And who's missing from the title? Well, Hal, of course, is still missing, but now Falstaff is missing as well. So why is this? What does this shift of focus do? Does, is this perhaps because uh, Hemings and Condell or the, the publisher wants people to take the, the plays a little bit more seriously, doesn't want to mention the comedy? Is it because this is now being grouped with other plays as specifically a history? So mention of the comic exploits would perhaps um, unsettle that generic distinction? We really don't know, but it's a very fascinating and interesting change, and it, it's very provocative in terms for thinking about what, what are these plays about. So the questions I think that it raises, one question is, who is this play about? Is it about Henry IV? Is it about Hotspur? Is it about Falstaff? Or is it about Prince Hal, the character who's not even mentioned? And then if we think about that 1598 title and the specific mention of Falstaff, well, what's the relationship of Falstaff's comedy and his experiences and his life to the history and the much more serious uh, story of Henry IV and the rebellions that he has to put down? 
What's the connection there? How does comedy, especially comedy of a false Staffian nature, how does that fit into what we think of as history? And where does Prince Hal fit? Where does he fit between these three very strong-willed uh, and very, very big, bigger-than-life in certain ways figures? His father, Henry IV, Hotspur, his rival, uh, with his also the same name, and John Falstaff, his sort of alternate father figure. Where does Hal fit in to this history? Where does he fit in between these people? Now let's talk about representing history. That is, what did history mean to Shakespeare, to Shakespeare's audience, to historians of the time? How did they represent history? So Shakespeare had a number of sources for his works um, and his historical works, his primary source was a work called The Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Uh, and of course it has a much longer subtitle, which was a, a multi-volume work um, very, very extensive work covering the, supposedly, in, in attempting to cover the entire history of these islands. Um, and it's primarily given under the name of Raphael Hollinshed, although there were other people that contributed. So these chronicles, the chronicle histories, that's where Shakespeare's stories, that's where all his histories come from, although he often supplements them with, with other sources as well. Now, although Shakespeare used many different sources, um, the Chronicles were his primary source, and it's useful to look at how the Chronicles are uh, written to get an idea of what history meant in Shakespeare's time. So these volumes, and again, they're, they're multiple volumes, very long work, um, with separate sections for England, Scotland, and Ireland. Within those sections, they're organized primarily in chronological order by the rulers. So from the earliest ruler of England to the most to the most recent. And interestingly enough, the narrative, Hollandshed goes all the way back to Noah. Uh, he says, thus was this island inhabited within 200 years after the flood by the children of Japheth, the son of Noah. So putting English history within the context, connecting it to biblical history, connecting it to God's story um, as a way to make English history part of a larger narrative and also to give the English people a certain pedigree by connecting them to this ancient biblical patriarch. Uh, and so obviously um, we can see that they include figures like Noah that are really mythical figures that, that there isn't historical evidence for. And many other um, figures were considered historical, were considered to be real people in Hollandshed's time. Kings like King Arthur, King Lear, that now historians uh, conclude did not actually exist. But they did not necessarily make that decision, distinction in, in Shakespeare's time. They didn't necessarily have the same uh, historical uh, methods that we have for research. The difference between legend and real history was not very distinct. So they include these mythical figures um, in, in the history of England, Ireland, and Scotland. And again, organized chronologically by rulers, and then within each ruler's chapter, it goes year by year. So 1199 in King John's reign, 1200 in King John's reign, 1201 in King John's reign. So it's a very um, uh, simple chronological format. And each year it's 1199, this is what happened. 1200, this is what happened. 1201, this is what happened. And it's a focus exclusively on the lives and exploits of the rulers and the nobility, their wars and conflicts, their alliances, marriages, offspring, deaths, things like that. Oftentimes telling very, um, uh, uh, not just saying this is, this is what happened, the king did this or this war happened, but sometimes even, even picturing, um, for example, in the chapter on Henry IV, has scenes of him and his son talking and, and uh, uh, engaging with each other. So even though it's about the lives and exploits of the rulers, it does get into their personal experiences as well. But you'll notice nothing about the people, nothing really beyond the lives of the great men who ruled the, the island. With that in mind, we can think about 
just what influence these the Chronicles had on Shakespeare. Um, so we see that the plays are organized, they're titled uh, based on the ruler. Um, so they're organized around a central ruling figure, even if other characters are as prominent or more prominent. For example, in Henry IV, uh, in the Henry IV plays, we can make an argument that Falstaff, Prince Hal, and Hotspur are equally as prominent as the king, or perhaps even more prominent. Um, whereas a play like Richard III, Richard III is definitely the dominant figure. In the Henry VI plays, Henry VI is often not the dominant figure. So, but they still are organized around the ruler as the, the central figure that, that the action surrounds or, or occurs around. Uh, the plays also generally focus on political conflict, wars, etc., as well as the personal lives of the rulers, their marriages and alliances and things like that. But what Shakespeare and other playwrights of the period do is they expand on what counts as history. They include things in their history plays that Hollinshed would never have included in the Chronicles. So let's think, how was history to be written about? Um, if one was a, a writer, a literary writer, writing about a historical event, um, how was one to represent history? Well, there was a, a, a principle called decorum, which is a principle that goes back to Aristotle and, and, and Greek and Roman uh, uh, rhetorical theory and poetic theory. But the idea was, and this was a popular among some, uh, especially among some aristocrats in Shakespeare's time, the idea was that when you wrote, if you were a poet, an artist, a playwright, the style that you wrote in had to be appropriate to the subject matter and the characters that you're writing about. So if you're writing a serious story, you should focus on characters of high rank, nobles, uh, aristocrats, great warriors, things like that. Serious stories should not contain low characters. They shouldn't contain clowns and fools. They should not contain broad humor, uh, humor uh, about uh, you know bodily functions, sex jokes, things like that. And on the other hand, if one is writing a comedy, it is not appropriate to put noble characters in ridiculous situations. You shouldn't have noble characters doing things that make them laughable. Comedies are supposed to be focused on uh, characters that you can laugh at, fools, people of low status. So there's this idea that um, style, subject matter, character, all had to be carefully matched to each other. But popular theater in Shakespeare's time pretty much completely ignored classical principles of decorum, as well as many other um, supposedly classical ideas about how one was supposed to write. And we see an example of someone complaining about this. Uh, Sir Philip Sidney, who was an aristocrat and a noted poet, in a work he wrote called A Defense of Poesy, A Defense of Poetry. He was writing this in the early 1580s. Um, and he writes, he's complaining about, uh, he, he's talking about poetry and defends it, but then he starts to talk about the plays in England, which he says, the plays in England are actually terrible, um, and I'm not gonna defend those. And he says, he writes, our tragedies and comedies are not without cause cried out against, observing rules neither of honest civility nor of skillful poetry. Besides these gross absurdities, he talks about how uh, uh, the stage, at one point someone could be standing on the stage and say they're in Africa, and then they move two feet and they say they're in Europe, and then they move and they say they're in Asia. Someone can, at the beginning of a play, be a baby, at the end of the play, be an old man. And he says this is absurd. He says, but even besides that, their plays be neither right tragedies nor right comedies, mingling kings and clowns, not because the matter so carry it, carries it, but thrust in the clown by the head and shoulders to play a part in majestical matters with neither decency nor discretion. So as neither the admiration and commiseration nor the right sportfulness is by their mongrel tragedy, tragicomedy obtained. So Sidney is complaining here that we take these plays and you put kings in with clowns and then you don't have a tragedy, you don't have a comedy, you have just a big mess. You have just a big mongrel mixed thing that doesn't work one way and it doesn't work the other way. Now, uh, uh, Sidney died before Shakespeare um, started writing in London, before Shakespeare ever came to London. But this could describe Henry IV, part one and two, and the role of Falstaff almost perfectly. These are plays in which kings and clowns are mingled. This is a play in which Falstaff thrusts his head in and 
practically disrupts the entire narrative. So even though Sidney is not talking about Shakespeare, this could be perfectly applied to what Shakespeare does, the way he is violating the classical principles to do something new in his depiction of history. So the question that we ask, and this is a question that, that scholars continue to talk about, is how do the exploits of Falstaff, as well as the other low matters that we see in this play, the scenes with the ostlers, for example, and the, the, uh, the horses, all these, these moments of low humor, how do they challenge our idea of what makes history, of what history is? That's something to consider as you're reading this play, how, and, and the following one, of course, the, the Henry IV Part Two. how does Falstaff fit into the history of the king? All right, I'm going to finish up by talking about Henry's road to the crown. How did Henry IV become Henry IV, and where are we at the beginning of this play? So we have to go back to the play Richard II, which was written uh, a few years earlier. Um, in this play, it begins with Richard, uh, recently crowned king. He is, he is a very um, proud king. He is very triumphant in state. That's where the, the play begins. And there's a conflict at the opening of the play between Henry Bolingbroke, Bolingbroke who is Richard's cousin, um, and Thomas Mowbray, who's another noble. And they're feuding because Henry has accused Mowbray of misusing uh, uh, the king's funds and of being involved in the death of the Duke of Gloucester, who was one of Richard's uncles, and so also an uncle to, to Henry Bolingbroke. And there is even a, 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 there was some suspicion that Richard may have been involved in his uncle's murder, and there's some hint of that in the text. Henry doesn't come out and say that, but there's, there's suggestions that many people think Richard was somehow involved. Mowbray is essentially covering up for Richard. Now, these two are uh, in, in a feud, Mowbray and Bolingbroke, and they are about to uh, actually have a duel when Richard interrupts and he banishes them both from England. And he banishes Mowbray permanently, and he banishes Henry for 10 years, although he then shortens it to six years when he sees how sad Henry's father is. Um, and as, as we see it in the play, this isn't really a great move for Richard. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and even Mowbray says, this is not going to end well for you. You're going to be um, deposed as king. And it doesn't help to make Richard look any less guilty. It only increases suspicion that he was involved in the Duke of Gloucester's murder. After Bolingbroke is exiled, John of Gaunt, his father, who is a, an old aged man, he dies partially from grief at his son's uh, exile. And after he dies, Richard seizes his lands and titles. Now, this was legal. Richard did have the right to do this, but the problem was is he didn't, Henry, Henry Bolingbroke also had a right to sue for his lands, to make the case that he should receive his father's lands despite being in exile and that Richard shouldn't just take them. Richard never gives Henry that option. So by stealing John of God's land or taking John of God's lands, um, the other nobles in England become very angry at Richard and they're very nervous about their own status because of his unfair seizure of land. They're worried about what might happen to them. Uh, they see him as financially wasteful. He's taking this money and using it to fund wars, particularly his war in Ireland. And he's lavishing gifts and power and authority uh, on some groups of favorites, a few of his favorites, who many of the other nobles see as parasites and manipulators. So when Richard banishes Bolingbroke, he makes a few really big missteps and he starts to turn the nobility against him. Bolingbroke secretly returns to England. Uh, he's helped back to England by some of these now angry uh, nobles, and he begins to gain supporters for his cause. But the idea here at first, he he's, gives the impression that all he wants is to reclaim his land and title. All I'm doing is coming back to England to get what is due to me. And that's when he lets everyone believe that's the way he presents himself. While 
uh, and while he's there, Richard leaves to go to Ireland to oversee the war. And while Richard is away, Bolingbroke and his allies raise an army and attack. And they defeat the forces that are led by Richard's favorites, and they execute them. And Bolingbroke even manages to win the support of the Duke of York, who has been ruling in Richard's absence, and gets the Duke of York to come over to Bolingbroke's side. And Richard finally returns. People are one, they don't even know if Richard is maybe dead since the war in Ireland has gone, has gone bad, but Richard returns. And upon returning, Henry doesn't just say, I'm here to reclaim my land and title. He decides he's gonna take the crown for himself and calls himself King Henry IV. And he imprisons Richard. And it's actually in the play, it's a very um, dramatic moment, Richard's best, most kingly moment in the play, uh, because he is basically an, an ineffective king. That was Richard's problem. Even though he is the rightful king, he's not a very good one. His most kingly moment in the play comes when he abdicates the throne, when he's forced to give up the crown and give it to Henry, um, but he makes a spectacle of it and really... Uh, highlights the fact that, you know, makes everyone, makes it clear to everyone that Henry is taking the crown from the rightful king. So now Henry is king, Richard is in prison, but the internal strife that Henry has stirred up in the conflict between his supporters and the supporters of Richard starts to get out of hand. And so a group of nobles, uh, they decide they're not happy with this new king. They like Richard better. They're not happy that Henry has usurped the throne. They start to plot a rebellion, but they're discovered and thwarted. Henry forgives some, he executes others. But Henry's reign seems relatively secure, but that's not a good, it's not a very auspicious start to begin your reign by having to put down a potential rebellion. And of course, he's nervous. Henry is nervous that Richard is still alive because as long as Richard is alive, he is a potential uh, rallying point for people who are dissatisfied with Henry. So another noble named Exton, who hears Henry talking about his fears of Richard, he decides in order to advance his, his own state, his own status, he breaks into the prison and kills Richard. And he does so hoping to win Henry's favor. But when Henry finds out about this, he's not happy. And this is in the very end of the play. He repudiates Exton condemns Exton for his, for his deeds in murdering Richard and says, though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer, love him murdered. I hate the person who murdered Richard and I love Richard even though I wanted him dead. Of course, it's very safe for Henry to say this now that Richard is dead. Um, and of course, there's suspicion at the time in the play and in the Henry IV plays that Henry was more involved in this murder than he let on. And so the play ends with him feeling guilty because of his usurpation of the throne, which he recognizes as um, a potential, you know, a, a potential sin. He's, he's upset. He feels guilty over the death of Richard. So he plans a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to cleanse himself of his sins. And if you'll notice, how does Henry IV, part one, begin? With Henry saying, okay, now that we've got these internal conflicts, these internal rebellions put down, it's time to go to the Holy Land. But further rebellions prevent him from doing that. So Henry's reign then is very much shaped by the story of Richard II and the way Henry came to the throne, taking the crown from Richard. And this is something that we see throughout the Henry IV plays, even into Henry V, if we were to read that in class. Henry is plagued throughout his reign by questions of legitimacy. Richard was in the lineal descent. He received the crown through his father, through his grandfather. So he is in the direct descent. Whereas Henry is further down the line, there are other people in between Henry and Richard in terms of the uh, in terms of their closeness to the the um, uh, the crown. So R Henry is outside of that lineal descent. That is what Richard's right. So he receives the crown by right, but Henry usurps it. So we have that. And really, what it is is a conflict between right or between the divine right, the right that that Richard has as the son and grandson of kings versus Henry's much better ability to lead. Henry is a much better king when it comes to leading, rallying people to his, 
uh, to his side and to waging war. So this, this conflict between, well, what makes a king? Is, is it more important to have a good king or to have a king, a king that knows what he's doing or a king that is supposed to be king according to God, according to divine right, according to uh, the line, the lineage, and the way the crown has been passed down from king to king? So that's a central question. What makes a king legitimate? Henry's reign is also marked by internal divisions. Um, as he was Richard's kin and countryman and ally and became Richard's foe, and uh, the nobles who had supported Richard flocked to Henry to support him against Richard, the worm turns, so to speak, and Henry's former allies, the, the Percys uh, in particular, now become his foes. And the land is also marked by uh, uh, conflict from the Welsh and conflict from Scotland. The Welsh are rebelling. We see Owen Glendower in Henry the Fourth, Parts 1 and 2 as the Welsh rebel um, trying to cast off the English uh, yoke and invasion from the independent nation of Scotland to the north, um, long time uh, uh, problematic relationships with England, and now many of Henry's former allies start to join with uh, the Welsh and the Scottish now against him. So this chaos, this internal division, this strife among um, people who are ostensibly kin and countrymen, but now find themselves at each other's throats. And finally, Henry's reign is marked by a sense of his own personal failings and guilt. He, he feels all the way from uh, Richard II throughout his, the plays in which Henry IV is, is present, he expresses guilt over the way he came to the throne, over taking the crown from Richard and over Richard's death. And he feels a great deal of guilt and sin for that, and he wants to cleanse himself. He wants to expiate himself by um, going to Jerusalem, by doing something for the Holy Land, doing something for God to show his humility, to purge that guilt from his uh, from his life and from his reign. And as we see throughout the Henry IV plays, he also blames his son Hal's debauched ways. Prince Hal, who rather than being a, a princely noble young man, is out getting drunk with Falstaff and, and playing tricks and, and doing all this other um, stuff that's not very kingly. Henry repeatedly asks, is this because of Richard's death? Is this a curse on me? Do I have this dissolute, debauched son who I'm afraid will not make a good king, who I can't pass the crown to? Is this punishment for, for my role in Richard's death? And that's a question that we see throughout the Henry IV plays. And again, even in Henry V, um, Prince Hal, now become King Henry, becoming a very noble, well-respected ruler, even he says, Am I being plagued by my father's sins in Richard's death? So Henry's reign, marked by these troubles, marked by strife, conflicts at all level, um, and marked really by Henry's attempt to figure out how to become king, how to solidify his role. His son Hal's attempt to figure out how do I become the next king? How do I shape myself to take the throne after my father's death? So just a brief review, um, we talked about history as a story, as legend, as fact, history, what history meant to Shakespeare and Shakespeare's audience. It's very flexible as a genre, flexible as a term. It can include things that we consider to be true and historical. It can include things that we consider to be legendary and mythical. It can include things that we consider to be not historical at all. So the term history, what it means it's, it's vague, it's, it's very suggestive, but it's not definite. So the genre is flexible, and Shakespeare is taking advantage of that flexibility of the idea of history by including a character like Falstaff. And so that leads us to this question, what counts as history? What events count as history? Who, whose history is it? Is this the history of England? Is this the history of Prince Hal? Is this the history of King Henry? And who is history? Is John Falstaff a historical character? 
in in reality, no. But um, are people like Falstaff historical characters? Does history just include the kings, the hotspurs, the nobles? Or does it also include people like Poins and Bardal and Mistress Quickly, these commoners, these people whose lives are not at all concerned with the, the matters of state, but who are just simple people who might live very simple lives? Is that history? And how does that relate to what we normally consider to be history? And then finally, Henry IV, a king whose reign is troubled from its very origin, from its very beginning, in the play Richard II, and we see in these two plays, Henry IV's parts one and two, Henry attempting to come to grips with the troubles uh, of his reign, attempting to solidify his reign, attempting to cleanse himself of his past sins uh, in order to truly become the king and not just a usurper. So uh, with that in mind, I hope that this has been informative. If you have any questions on history, on Henry IV, on anything that I've talked about here, please, of course, contact me via email. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Otherwise, I will see you in class. I wish you the day and week and weekend and life that you wish yourself. I'll talk to you soon.